All right. Hey, today we're going to look at 10 questions. Stick around. Number nine and 10 are tough ones. Number 10, a correctable error scenario. But let's get started and look at rules questions. Greetings and welcome back to the Basketball Rules Expert, the show where we take National Federation of High School Basketball Rules and lift them off the printed page, breathe life into them, simplify, clarify, amplify, so we can take those rules with us onto the basketball court. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with a betterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official for over a decade. Consider myself to be a bit of a basketball rules expert, and this show is all about helping you on a journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. Do allow me a moment to appeal for an opportunity for you to hit like, subscribe, and notify so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We live stream every Wednesday and Friday. Join us for the live stream. Put your voice in the game, and that way we can all get better together. Allow me to thank uh, our tremendous show supporters who fuel our broadcast. Charles Fogel, Fred Thompson, David Barnett, Nick Hahn, and Janice Brown. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? There will be a link in the show notes and you can have an opportunity to do that as well. All right. Today we are looking at rules, questions, rules, scenarios to help us improve as basketball officials to make sure that we can take those rules with us onto the court to keep sharp and keep our understanding of the rules, fill in any cracks, that, that we may have, think about variations on plays, et cetera, so that we can adjudicate plays properly when we go on to the basketball court. So let's get started today with our very first rules question. When can a three second violation occur? A, when the ball is in the team's backcourt, B, when the ball is out of bounds during a throw-in. C, during an interrupted dribble in the team's front court. Or D, when a try is in flight. Right, a super simple question to help us get started today on Basketball Rules Expert, right? And this one, this one goes out to all those parents in the stands who are yelling, three seconds, three seconds, with a complete misunderstanding of the rule. But of course, we bring with us a complete understanding of the rule and three seconds, right? A three second violation may only occur when the ball is in team control in the front court, right? Makes things super simple. So in A, when the team is in the ball, when the ball is in the team's back court, we cannot have a three second violation. Uh, when the ball is out of bounds during a throw in, no, we cannot have a, a, viola, a three second violation. And D, when a try is in flight, do we have team control? No. No, we do not. So obviously, our correct answer here is C. During an interrupted dribble, right, where team control still exists, we can have a three second violation. Now, this may not be our highest priority in this situation. We may be focusing on, right, obviously we're going to have players competing for the basketball, but this is the only one of these four situations where it is even possible to have a three-second violation, right? So that's our correct answer on this play. Right. A lot of times we get pressure in the game from outside forces from those who do not know the rules. Coaches, stakeholders in the game, um, fans, right? We get energy from the stands. Three seconds, three seconds. We get it in a situation with multiple putbacks as well, right? We just have to recognize the fact that this is a very misunderstood rule in high school basketball. We don't want to misunderstand the rule. Uh, but it is what it is. All right, a super simple 
three second question to get us started today. Let's look now at our next rules question. During a throw in, A1 passes the ball to A2, who is located in the front court. A2 fumbles the ball and the ball goes into the back court. A2 retrieves the ball and dribbles back to the front court. This is a backcourt violation. A, correct. B, incorrect. Right? This, uh, in the recent years, and for new officials, this question comes up over and over and over again. Right? Um, perception about this play. The throw in contacts a teammate in the front court, goes into the back court because it was deflected. Uh, off the player, goes into the backcourt, player goes into the backcourt and recovers the basketball, right? Really straightforward scenario, one that happens a lot in our game. Obviously, we need to be aware of the rules of regarding backcourt. And what we're, one of the essential elements is that first and foremost, we must have team control on the court. During a throw-in, we have team control, but it's only uh, given to the team during the throw-in for the administration of fouls, right? We can't have a backcourt violation until we have team control on the court. So in this situation where the player, th uh, the throw-in pass is deflected by a teammate, bounces into the backcourt, a player A2 picks up the basketball in the backcourt. That is the point where we have established team control on the court because we have player control on the court. Player control, holding or dribbling the basketball, not the deflection. So in this instance, our correct answer is no, 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 no. This is not a backcourt violation. The correct answer is B, this is incorrect. And we need to be aware of that distinction right, that the requirement is we must have team control on the court in order for there to be a backcourt violation by rule, right? Once we know that, it makes, things, it makes our lives a lot easier, right? Now, sometimes we can have throw-in situations that, um, you know, are less obvious, right? A division line throw-in uh, to a teammate who's close, who goes in the backcourt, everything's in our purview here. Sometimes when we get like an end line throw-in, <coughs> and it comes back to the division line, we sort of get disconnected with the concept that this is still during a throw-in, right? We have to be aware of that. But a simple and straightforward rules question, one that we have to know, backcourt on a throw-in, right? We need to nail that down, and we do with that previous question. But now let's look at our next rules question. A1 is located in the back court and passes the ball towards the front court. B1, located in the front court, taps the ball back towards the back court. A1 jumps from the front court, catches the ball before it hits the back court, then lands in the front court. The officials rule a back court violation. Were the officials correct or incorrect? Right? We imagine this scenario. Players in the back court, we have team control on the court, throws the ball towards the front court, defensive team, contacts the basketball, knocks it back, teammate of the thrower jumps from the front, from the back court rather, catches the ball in the air and lands in the front court. If we see that sort of ping pong ball action, that can throw us for a loop. Right, we may be surprised by uh, you know the sequence of events. This may be a processing play, right? We're thinking things through, right? But if we always remember our three elements that must be in place for a backcourt violation, we must have team control on the court. We had that in this situation. We must be the last to touch in the front court and the first to touch in the backcourt, right? So we think of this play scenario, who was the last to touch the ball in the front court? The defense. The defense was, right? B1 in the front court tapped the ball back. So we cannot have a backcourt violation on this play. Now, of course, if we are aware, in 2007, there was a rules interpretation 
that said when the defense contacts the ball, the offensive team must allow the ball to land in the back. It was an erroneous ruling and one that if you don't know about it, it's better not to know about it, right? And then in reaction to that, trying to fix it, NFHS created some uh, some additional language in the backcourt rule, which did not really help in the situation, in my opinion. But be that what it may, be that as it may, be that as it may. Our correct answer on this play is incorrect. This is not a backcourt violation by rule, right? Because the, we have a missing element on the play. The, the team in control was not the last to touch in the front court, right? Our simple formula, if something's missing, there's no violation. This is a legal play. We could understand, though, why this would be a heavy processing play, right? The ping pong action around the division line, uh, you know, front court status achieved, jumping from the back court to the front court, all of these things can, uh, you know, give us pause and force us to think. But in the end, we process it all. We recognize we did not meet the criteria of our formula, and we have no back court violation by rule. All right, a second back court rules question to keep us sharp. Got to know the backcourt rules. Let's move on now to our next rules question. A1 is holding the ball but losing her balance. Which of the following results in a violation? A1 touches the floor with one hand while holding the ball with the other. B. A1 touches the floor with her knee. C. A1 touches teammate A2's arm while A2's foot is partially out of bounds or d a1 touches the floor with the ball which she is holding right a1 holding the basketball loses her balance touches the floor with one hand is that legal hands and feet always legal right the player could go down to a prone position a push-up position holding on one hand right legal touches a teammate's arm while that teammate is out of bounds that's the one that's the puzzler right it's like wait a minute can if i know if the ball contacts the player who's out of bounds it's out of bounds can the player holding the ball contact a player or a person right such as an official while the official is out of bounds right? That is legal by rule. The ball can't contact that person, that individual. The player on the court can. I like how it says, uh, while one foot is partially out of bounds, if a foot is in contact with the area off the court, the foot is out of bounds. (laughs) That player is out of bounds. And A1 touches the floor with the ball, which she is holding, right? So a player losing their balance, holding the basketball, places the ball on the floor to help them gain their balance. That is also legal by rule. So our correct answer on this play is obviously B. A1 touches the floor with her knee. A player may not touch the, uh, while holding the basketball, may not touch the floor with anything other than their hands or their feet. If they put an arm down, that is illegal. If they put a knee down, that is illegal. If they fall on their backside, that is illegal. Hands, feet, legal, straightforward, easy, easy to remember. Hands, feet, legal. Even if we see awkward uh, gymnastic uh, displays by, by a player who, let's say this player put the ball down and then was still losing their balance, uh, you know, picked the ball up and put a hand down, uh, got into that wild uh, prone position. All of these things would be legal by rule, right? And we just, we, we again, we see something, there's a lot of things going on, visual stimulus. Everybody thinks, oh, that's got to be something, right? There's energy rises in the building. Our brain is saying, where's the illegal? Where's the illegal? I don't see illegal. A key takeaway from that one, 
one that we could take with us onto the court is we're going to see all sorts of extravagant stuff, unusual things. Energy rises and falls in the building. But we're waiting for our brain to say that, that right there is illegal. If we respond to that and respond to that only, we're in better position to adjudicate plays properly. All right, let's look now at another rules question. With eight minutes remaining on the pregame clock, A1, who is listed as a starter in the scorebook, suffers a sprained ankle is and is unable to begin the game. The head coach for Team A needs to replace A1 as a starter to begin the game. What is true about this situation? A, because it is after the 10-minute mark during pregame, this change in the scorebook would require an administrative technical foul to be made. B, because A1 was already listed as a starter, the player must be on the floor for the opening tip. C, if a player is removed from the starting lineup, the player may not participate in the game. Or D, if the player is unable to start the game due to injury or illness, there is no penalty to replace the player, and the player may return to the game without penalty when they are again able to play. Right? So it's an unusual situation, doesn't something that doesn't happen frequently, but one that could give us pause. We're like we're we're doing we're getting ready for the game, pre-game, we're watching the players, footwork, etc. Shooters, identifying left-handed shooters, you know, looking at the post-play, warm-ups, all the things, equipment on the players, so that we could start the game promptly. And then something unusual happens, and the coach says, Hey, 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 a uh, ref, ref, uh, one of my players, you know. Uh, injured themselves, and so I'm going to have to uh, replace them uh, in the starting lineup. Uh, they may come to you and say, I don't know what happens next here. Is that something, has this risen to the level of something illegal? Um, but it helps us here to think about the fact that in National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, it's a, partici a participation sport. Players may begin the game, they may get injured, they may have blood, they may have uh, a lost contact lens and, and need to leave the game. They may have illegal equipment on and be uh, told to leave the game. Players can always return to the game until they are disqualified, right? So that's a basic concept that we could take with us onto the court. Players are always allowed to return to the game. Now, wait a minute. At other levels, right, like NBA, if a player is injured and can't shoot their free throws... And then they can't play in the game anymore, right? So there can be some sort of perception that uh, there's a restriction that comes when a player is unable to do something. But in this situation, no such restriction exists. Our correct answer here is D. If the player is unable to start the game, they can be replaced uh, by another player in the starting line. If they are uh, unable to start the game due to injury or illness, Injury or illness, right? Players twist their ankle, right? They're not going to play in this game, right? So that's really straightforward. An awareness that we can bring with us onto the basketball court. There may be some confusion around this, like our scorekeeper may be confused, the visiting coach. Maybe we need to do some communication about what our situation is, right? The other coach is like, oh, that's a technical foul or, or or something weird, right? And we may have to, uh, you know, talk people off the ledge and say what we have here is the replacement of a starter for injury or illness. This is legal by rule, right? That player may then further participate, but of course they could not participate until the clock had properly started. They could not substitute back into the game until the clock had properly started. So a straightforward but unusual play that could catch us a little off guard in that in that time frame of the pregame warm-ups where we are getting our thoughts together preparing to officiate the game um, and you know busy doing other things identifying uh, things on the court all right a simple question but one that could catch us a bit off guard in that pregame scenario but let's now look at another rules question 
After A1's try is released and is in flight, the official inadvertently blows the whistle. The ball hits the ring, but the try is unsuccessful. What is the result? A, the throw-in is awarded to Team A regardless of the direction of the possession arrow. B, the throw-in is awarded to Team B regardless of the direction of the possession arrow. C, the throw-in is to the team entitled to the alternating possession throw-in. Or D, the throw-in is at the spot nearest to where the try was unsuccessful. Right? So we have a situation where a player releases a try for goal. The official inadvertently uh, blows a whistle. Does the ball become dead? Right? That's the first thing we <laughs> the first thing we absolutely have to understand is does that whistle make the ball dead when a try is in flight? Right? No. No, it does not. So the result of the try will count despite the whistle, the inadvertent whistle. Right? So that's 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 rule number one. Status, live ball, dead ball, have to know that in that situation, right? But the try misses. The ball now becomes dead when the try misses. What do we do next? We have to resume play. We're going to use one of the three methods for resuming play. Those are either going to be a free throw, a jump ball, or in this case, a throw-in. Who gets the throw-in, right? We have no team control, and we have a throw-in that is due, right? So we have to go then to the possession arrow right? This is simple. This is straightforward. We like simple and straightforward. So we are going to go to the possession arrow and we're going to reward an alternating possession throw into the team that has the arrow. So our correct answer here is going to be C. A throw into the team entitled to the alternating possession throw in and the throw in would be at the spot nearest to where the ball was when the try ended. So we're going to have an end line throw in to the team that is has the ball for throwing, right? Simple and straightforward. That's a big part of why we have alternating possession throw-ins so that we can resolve situations like this. At, in, uh, in the NBA, they would have a, if we have this same situation, they're going to have a jump ball at the nearest circle. Of course, in high school, we do not uh, have jump balls once we have the initial jump ball. Really straightforward. We like straightforward in our game. So we're going to the alternating possession arrow here when we have an inadvertent try, uh, inadvertent whistle rather, while a try is in flight and the try misses. Now, what if the ball had gone in, right? If the ball had gone in, then we would go to our point of interruption, which would be the ball entering the basket, the opponent of the team that scored would have an end line throw in, non designated spot throw in, right? Think those through. Straightforward. We like straightforward. We like easy. So, a little refresher there on inadvertent whistle during a fly, a try that is in flight. Let's look. look up. <laughs> All right, a little refresher there on an inadvertent whistle while a try is in flight. But now let's look at our next rules question. Team B scores a basket with six seconds left in the game, and the score is A, 65, B, 64, a one-point lead. Team B applies tight pressure on the throw-in by A, 1. The ball is kicked by B, 3 near the end line. A, charge B, 3 with a technical foul for kicking the ball. B, Team B receives a designated spot throw-in on the end line. C, Team A retains the privilege to run the end line on the ensuing throw-in. Or D, Team A should receive a designated spot throw-in along the end line since the throw-in legally ended when B3 touched the ball. Right? So that's the sort of the conundrum here is, well, okay, we know it's a violation and we know we're going to have a resulting throw-in related to the violation. Great right? But what kind of throw-in is it, right? This is sort of a unique situation that can occur after a made basket and a, the team has the ability to run the end line. We have a kicked ball in that situation. 
does the team retain that ability or do we go to what would normally be the penalty for a kicked ball, which would be a designated spot throw-in nearest where the ball was kicked, right? And this is, so it, it, it's understandable why we would have some confusion about this rule because, you know, in all other situations, a kicked ball would result in a designated spot throw-in. But in this situation where a team has the ability to run, right, uh, you know, does that override this, right? So that, that's, a, that's a logical uh, question that could catch us a little off guard, right? And the fact that we're putting it in an end of game scenario, right, where this, uh, what we do on this play becomes really important. And that's also a great thing to recognize. Anytime we have a rules question, right, if we can apply it to an end of game scenario where our ruling will have a critical out, uh, affect the outcome of the game and we want to get everything 100% correct, right? If this, if this play occurred with, you know, seven minutes remaining in the first period and we get it wrong, it's like not such a big deal. So if we always apply rule scenarios and think, okay, in an end of game situation with two seconds left, tie game, one point lead, etc., right? So in this situation, um, it's important to understand that National Federation of High School Rules says, they retain the privilege after the made basket and this situation occurs, right? That's, that's, that's the default when a team scores and has that privilege and the opponents do something illegal. The default is we're not going to take away that privilege as a result. So if the defense had an excessive swinging of elbows violation, uh, any sort of violation here that, um, it does not take away that um, designated spot capability, right? So understanding that the, the basic default is always retain the privilege to run the end line. Retain the privilege to run the end line. If we keep that as a default that we could take with us onto the basketball court, we're in the best position to get these plays, which may take us aback in the moment, um, to get these plays correct by rule. Seven questions down, three questions to go. Let's look at our next rules question. To which team and where is the throw-in that follows a double technical foul that occurs while Team A has control of the ball? A, Team A at the division line. B, Team A at the point of interruption nearest the spot of the double technical foul. C, Team A at the point of interruption nearest the spot where the ball was located. Or D, to the team with the alternating possession arrow nearest the point of interruption. At the spot of the double technical foul, right? So this could throw us for a loop. Right. We, let's say we have two players who uh, start jawing at each other under the basket um, while the while the ball is in play. Um, t double tees are assessed to those two players by the lead official. Trail official is has the ball uh, being closely guarded near the division line while this occurs. Where do we go next, etc. Right, a lot of things come into play. Well, technical fouls, division line opposite the table. Uh, wait, no double. Uh, right, we go to the spot nearest the foul, uh, nearest the where the players were located, etc. A lot of things can come into play, and we could potentially become a little confused. But of course, our key concept on this play is double, double technical, double foul, always. No free throws will be shot. Resume play at the point of interruption. What does point of interruption mean? It means what was going on. Team A had team control, was dribbling the ball near the division line. That is the point of interruption. Ball to that team at the spot nearest to where the ball was in that instance, right? Double means point of interruption. No free throws shot, point of interruption. Simple and straightforward. So our correct answer here is C. Team A at the point of interruption nearest to where the ball was 
nearest to the spot where the ball was located, right? If we could take that verbiage with us in our brain, oh, double foul? Okay, that's point of interruption, ball at the spot nearest to where it was. Now, let's say a try was in flight in this situation, right? Let's say a try was in flight. Well, then what would we have? What's our point of interruption, right? There's no team control, but does the ball become dead when the double tactical fouls? Again, status, status. If the try was in flight and this play occurred and double tacticals, we have a whistle, the official says double tactical, ball goes in the basket. What do we do now, right? The ball was not dead due to the whistle for the double tactical. So our point of interruption is score the goal. Let's say the try had missed, right? Point of interruption was no team control. After the try ended, we would, just in a, as in our previous question, go to the possession arrow for the resulting free throw. So if we could take with us onto the court that double tactical, double personal, double intentional, double flagrant will always, always, always be no free throws attempted, ball at the point of interruption. If we have just one takeaway today, and we can always remember that double, double, no free throws attempted, ball at to resume, play resumed at the point of interruption, that's a valuable thing that we can always take with us onto the basketball court. But now our question number is dwindling down. We are now at our penultimate question. The fourth quarter ends with the score tied 60-60. to As the players for the two teams walk towards their respective benches, A1 curses at one of the officials because no foul was called on a last-second shot attempt. The officials assess a tactical foul against A1. A. The free throws awarded to Team B are a continuation of the fourth period. If any Team B player makes another one, either of the two free throws, Team B wins the game in regulation 61 to 60. B. The free throws awarded to Team B are at the start of the extra period. If any Team B player makes either of the two free throws, Team B wins the game in overtime 61 to 60. C. No free throws are awarded to Team B and the extra period starts with a jump ball. Or D. The free throws awarded to Team B are the start of the extra period. Following the two free throws, Team B will have a designated spot throw in at the division line opposite the table. And Team A will have the alternating possession arrow. Right? So, again, we always want to think how to adjudicate plays in end-of-game scenarios because the way that we adjudicate a play in this scenario is going to have a dramatic outcome, uh, out, a dramatic effect on the outcome of the game. If we make a mistake in this situation, the uh, a team may win uh, the game in a, in a fashion that they should not have been allowed by rule. And if we make a mistake in end-of-game situations, the the team that comes out on the short end of the decision has no opportunity to correct for a mistake that we make, right? So always thinking through end of game scenarios. And now this is a scenario, tie game, tactical foul after the expiration of time. How often does this happen? Not a lot, but we, if we, if we don't fully understand what happens next, we can, uh, you know, really take the game in the wrong direction. Right. So it's critical to understand that if a tactical foul occurs after all activity related to a period that 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 um, the penalty for that foul is part of the next period. That's our initial concept that we have to have on this play. Let's say it's the end of the first period and the same thing occurs. Or it's, let's say, the end of the second period, right? And the same thing occurs. The, the period has ended. The horn has sounded. A player thought they were fouled. Comes at the official. Does something that they are then assessed a tactical foul for that activity. Are we going to then shoot those free throws? No. Because the second period had ended. Those free throws will be part of the next period. 
So that's our, that's our fundamental concept that we take from the first period to the second, second to the third, third to the fourth. Now, we also have a situation here where it is an end of game scenario. Time has expired in the fourth period. If the score was not tied in this situation, then we are going to potentially say, okay, in that unique scenario, the technical foul, since we're not going to have another period necessarily, we have to then bring that penalty back into the fourth period, right? So that's a unique situation, right? If, if the, uh, the team that was ahead um, as was assessed a technical foul after the game. Let's say the coach was really irate at the crew, even though they had the uh, one-point lead and the coach berates the crew and is assessed a technical foul. In that situation, we would say, okay, since the technical foul will result in those free throws and those free throws could affect the outcome of the game, we will attempt those free throws as far to the part of the fourth period. That's a unique situation. But to get back to our play scenario, in this situation, the score is tied, right? So what we, the key thing here, the key takeaway here is we have to begin the next period with the assessment of this penalty. That's what we're going to do here in this scenario. So our correct answer here long way around, is that D, the free throws awarded to Team B are part of the extra period, right? Part of the extra period since the game was tied and there is an extra period to follow. Then we say, okay, then we're going to start the period with the assessment of those technical foul free throws. And after technical foul free throws, we always resume for with a division line throw in opposite to the, the table to the offended team. And when the ball is uh, at the disposal of the thrower, the possession arrow is, a, is set to the opponent. So a question that brings about how we can adjudicate a play in an end of game scenario when we have to dominate end of game scenarios and rules adjudication, right? That end of game period, we have to be at our best and make no mistakes, right? Perfection is required. Now we want to, we want to in all of our rules adjudication have perfection, but obviously in an end of game scenario, that is where it really, really comes to bear and we have to be at our best. All right. Nine questions down, one to go, a correctable error scenario. Let's see if we can nail this one. B3 commits a common foul on A3. It is Team B's seventh foul, but the scorer fails to recognize it, and the ball is awarded to Team A. A quick basket is scored by Team A, and the scorer then sounds the horn to notify the officials of the error. A, it is too late to correct the error. B, alternating, pos alternating possession arrow after the free throws. C, play will resume with the result of the bonus free throws awarded to A3. Or D, award A3 a bonus free throw with no players on the free throw lane line and the basket counts. Award Team B the ball for a throw-in. Right. So we have a situation where merited free throws were not awarded. Right. In this situation. And then we are presented with uh, resulting action occurs and the horn sounds and says, hey, ref, hey, ref, we should not have shot or we should have shot merited free throws. Right. So we need to immediately need to freeze frame on the game. What is our point of interruption? End line throw it. Has there been a change of possession? Team A had the ball. Now Team B has the ball. Right? We have those two facts. And now let's go to our correctable error scenario. Are we within the correctable error time frame? Is this correctable by rule? Right? The ball became live when we erroneously gave the team the ball for a throw-in. The ball became live. Ball became live. They dribbled around. They released a try. The ball went in the basket. The ball has become dead. At this point, the table notifies our crew. Are we within the correctable error time frame? Yes. 
Yes, we are. If the ball had become live after the dead ball, when the ball went in the basket, then our correctable error time frame would have closed. But in this situation, that's the play is correctable. Okay? Important to understand that. So how do we resume the game? In this situation, we have two facts. There's been a change of possession. Team A had the ball, and now Team B has the ball for the resulting throw-in. There's been a change of possession, right? And we know our point of interruption. Since that's the fact, this since that's the case, our correct adjudication here is to say, okay, we're going to resume with that end line throw in, but we still have to award the merited free throws. So we're going to clear the lane, award the merited free throws. If it's one and one and they miss the first, then we're done. If they make the first, they get a second. The result of those free throws goes in the game, and we're going to resume with that end line throw in. Right? So that's the key thing to remember when we have this situation. And what's really important about this situation is if we identify it is this is a situation where merited free throws should have been awarded and had failed to be awarded. Of all the correctable error scenarios, right, of which there are five, and four of them um, revolve around free throws being merited and unmerited, or this brain fart, right? This is the most common, right? Of, of those five, this one probably will have, be 80% of all correctable error scenarios you encounter. So how to adjudicate these plays is critical. And what we have to know in order to adjudicate properly is, has there been a change of possession? We gave the ball to team A. Has team B now have the ball? Or does team A still have the ball? If team A still had the ball here, and that we receive the notification from the table, then we would resume with the game with the bonus free throws. But since the goal has been scored and Team B now has the ball, we're going to resume with that Team B throw-in. So our key takeaway on this play, the correct answer here is, of course, D, award A3 bonus free throws with no players on the free throw lane line and the goal scores <laughs> award team b the ball for a resulting non-designated spot throw it that is our correct answer on this play right and so what we need to do is is say okay is have those two pieces of information what is our point of interruption and has there been a change of possession We're, then we can go to correctable error time frame is it correctable yes it is how are we going to resume right? If we dominate and correctable errors only in this one situation where merited free throws were failed to be awarded, we get most of our bang for buck and understanding of correctable error scenarios, right? Because this is the one that's going to happen most frequently. We don't usually award merited free throws and we should not have Right, we can have a situation where we don't fail to uh, score a goal, a three-point goal was not marked as three or scored as three, etc. Those are are probably the next most common. But this one, this one, where we failed to award because the the board says six, right? It's a scenario we co we come across frequently. So if we can nail this one, we're better off for it. Hey, thanks for joining us today for basketball rules expert hope you found value if you find this kind of content to provide value to you as a basketball official great time to do all the things you can hit like subscribe and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any of our content we live stream every wednesday and friday if you hit like it gets the video in front of more basketball officials and we can all get better together allow me to thank those who fuel our broadcasts, our tremendous show supporters, Charles Fogel, Fred Thompson, David Barnett, Nick Hahn, and Janice Brown. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? I'll put a link above, and I'll put one in the show notes. 
below. Awesome. We have additional video content available for you here. I have selected this video for your perusal. YouTube says this one would be better. You make your selection. Choose wisely and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.